Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the, uh, the final day of the 2011 Faculty Summit. Uh, my name is Alex Wade, and I'm the Director for Scholarly Communication within the Microsoft Research Connections Group. And uh, thanks for joining us uh, the, the morning after uh, the, the boat trip. So you're, you're all very brave to get up uh, early and make it in this morning. I appreciate it. Um, the session this morning is on Microsoft Academic Search. And uh, we've got three great speakers lined up for you today. Uh, I'd like you to welcome, first of all, Xin Zhu from the Microsoft uh, Research Lab in Beijing, China. Xin? Correct. Thank you, Alex. Oh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here to share with you guys the uh, academic search. Let me click on that. So the title, uh, thanks to uh, Alex and leaders, they suggest, why don't we tell them what's under the hood of Microsoft academic search? So um, yeah, we're going to do that. Um, so I'm a developer, and uh, I work in uh, Microsoft Research Asia in Beijing. So our group work with research groups in uh, MSR Asia and MSR to transfer technology into products, to do innovation, to sometimes directly ship our stuff to the outside, like academic search. So I used to write code and debug code, but uh, more and more so, I'm uh, writing PowerPoint and debug PowerPoint animations, so uh, bear with me if there are bugs in my PowerPoint animations. So, <coughs> first we, since we're going to talk under the hood, we are figure we need to just see what the hood is all about, right? And then we go under and then we go above to show you what we can offer to the community so that you can use the API to do a lot of cool things. All right, so let me just uh, go direct to live demo here. So currently, Microsoft Academic Search, the website, has about um, 27 million publications, including books and, and papers. And it covers about 13 million authors. And uh, it, we have weekly updates. So as you can see, last, last week, about 200,000 entities were updated. So our goal is to cover all the domains in, in the academic area. So we so far we already got 14 of them covered. We are expecting to finish the rest of the eight domains um, probably in the next three to six months, so that we have a full house for for our audiences. So if you if you go into any any particular domain, for example, computer science, you can see that um, each domain is arranged by, we call it, top-level entities. The authors, publications, conference, journals, organizations, and then uh, we have the, the subdomain. Uh, we divide computer science into the following subdomains. And of course, you can also, you can also search. So um, for example, you can search data mining. And you can see that uh, we immediately get, you figure out data mining is a keyword, and then uh, you can see all the authors that is, has been publishing papers about data mining, uh, the r related conferences about data mining, KDD, IICDM, and, well, and then the journals, uh, related keywords about data mining. And one thing that we are not just show you the, the kind of a shallow information about data mining, we can also show you that in the paper, how people are talking about data mining, right? So we 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 uh, process the full PDF, uh, the full text of paper, and then find out and extract the information about when people talk about data mining. There are about seventy six cases. Then what they are talking about. So the, we feel this is very helpful for the users, for the for the students who first enter a domain, and then the the. Professors say, well, why don't you read all these papers and study certain domains? And then they say, well, what is this data mining is all about? And then you can quickly get a glance 
of what uh, other people has, has been saying about a uh, certain keyword. So if you feel that's uh, very important, it's not just uh, finding a, a string match in some web document, but rather is we extract the definition and then the context out to show you uh, what people have been talking about some things. Uh, and of course, you can go to the papers. Um, for papers, we also have something that uh, is, we call it citation contest. And then it's, it's very important to see how many citations a paper gets, right? But it's also, it's also more meaningful that you, you, when you have 20 citations, but if you do not know how people are citing your paper, that might not be uh, so cool. So we have uh, a feature that you can, sh you can see the citation contest. That is when people cite your work, how they are saying your work before and after the, the, con uh, the citation anchor. So that you, can, you can see that uh, how your work is evaluated by other people. So I'm going to the next one. Um, we can we can search authors. This is my uh, one of my favorite. And when you search authors and in other um, services, sometimes you get you get a uh, just one per one ID that uh, it's a collection of all different authors. So we have spent a lot of time improving our algorithms and study the um, um, the challenge of name disambiguation so that if you search Michael Cohen, you, you can know that, okay, in the academic world at least, there are so many Michael Cohens here and um, uh, some of them we, we know pretty sure who they are, their affili affiliations, and some of them we, from the data we have, we can only figure out, well, we, there's a Michael A. Cohen who has one publication and he's in uh, physics, but uh, we haven't got enough inf information about that person yet. So as we can see that, the Michael Cohen brothers are very, very uh, excited about the uh, academic, and there yeah, are so many of them. Uh, and uh, we can go to one of them, uh, which is our colleague in MSR. And, um, and you can, here you can see that clearly the, the um, publications trend and citation trend, uh, either uh, cumulatively or uh, and the annual data. So this is something very interesting, because uh, the annual data used to be the default, the annual chart. But we did uh, some uh, user study and found out that um, most authors will get somewhat depressed after looking at this trend <laughs> because of the, uh, the citation. I mean, the, the current citation, recent citation is very hard to get, right? It's, the data is not ready yet. They, they, their reaction is, oh, I'm already over my peak time now, right? Because I will always go down. And uh, so we design another feature and say, well, see, cumulatively, you are always up. <laughs> so so, so well, that's uh, the user experience is very important. And uh, then, of course, you, have, you can see 193 uh, publication of uh, Michael F. Cohen, and then the, um, the conferences that uh, he's uh, a frequent visitor and uh, the keywords that uh, he's an um, he's expert of. And of course, he, he's affiliated with Microsoft. And then once you, you go to the organization, you can see that, okay, these are all the authors in uh, Microsoft, uh, a lot of them. And they, uh, you can see uh, kind of a, a Microsoft research as, um, as a whole, the, um, the, the research areas and then the, um, um, the, the, the domain chain. So there are so many domains and subdomains in computer science. What are the trends in Microsoft research? So this shows that uh, how, how the, the research focus area changes in, in, in an uh, organization. And another in interesting information we, we, we get is sometimes people ask, well, how is this organization compared to other organizations? Either as um, people want to choose um, a job, they want to go, should I go to this research org or the other one? Or when um, students, when they pick graduate schools, they want to compare which school is better, which school is uh, more appropriate for them. So we can, you, can, you can do a side-by-side -side comparison of uh, Microsoft and any research uh, organizations. For example, we can say uh, our good friend, um, IBM. So we can see that the, the publication trend over the 
long period of time and the citation chain. And sometimes people say, well, I want to go, I, get, I, I want to drill down to a certain domain. You can, you can definitely do that. And um, now you see that uh, both organizations information here. So uh, over here is the, uh, the kind of the keywords that Microsoft people are interested in. Over there is the keywords that IBM researchers are interested in. And the middle one is that uh, they're common, common uh, research areas. So you get, you get at it. And then you can also drill down to like, okay, I want to say the last five years, what happened? What happened uh, on them, and then uh, you get a you get a you get a new view of, of here, so you can see that um, um, uh, very rich information. So when we have so many uh, entities and we get uh, very precise information about them, it be it, it just be natural to project those uh, in different uh, visualizations. For example, you can see that okay. Um, we can project all the organizations in the in the world in the, in, in the map, so that you can quickly you can quickly see that okay, I, if I want to see the um, the top organization in, in biology, uh, you can you can see clearly what what where they are and then how they they compare to each other relatively here. And of course, um, for authors, let's go back to Michael Cohen again. And uh, we can also visualize the relationship that this author is having. Um, for example, we know that there's a famous uh, six de degree separation. You can see that, okay, everybody got a Erdos number, right? And then you can show that, uh, well, uh, Paul Erdos uh, co-author a paper with this person, and then the co-author with this person, and then eventually they co-author with this person. And I can see that. Um, I sometimes publish papers, so um, let me see if you can find me. So if I, if I want to kind of come out to Michael and say, well, maybe I, I can go, oh, see, I work with Frank, and Frank was, we work with um, uh, this person, and eventually here. So maybe I can, this chart can help me build a connection to, a, to another person by co-author information. And of course, you can see that uh, um, kind of a co-authorship that Michael has been working with all these different peoples. And then uh, this visualization shows you that who are citing Michael's work. As you can see, he has a huge influence um, in the, uh, uh, influence uh, these many people. And then uh, you, you can also see that there are wow, there are 39 papers published, and by this person who cites Michael's paper. So that's um, something uh, very interesting. Um, all right, so. Uh, one big feedback we get is that how can I uh, provide feedback to your data? Like, oh, you are missing the paper, or some information is not correct, uh, it always not the latest one. We have a user edit uh, feature that you can, uh, you can edit the author information, the home page, the photo, and whatnot. And you can also edit the publication, say, wow, this paper, uh, somehow you miss a, you you miss a, an author. You can also provide PDF, say the a link to us, saying, "Well, I, I have this paper you are not covering," and then you also uh, you can also provide call for paper information to us. Uh, you can also merge authors because uh, there are many different uh, uh, spellings of a, of same author. You can merge them. Or you can also merge publications, and you can also provide a, a by text format to us so that we can uh, integrate them back to our. Uh, uh, database. So that's all for the um, for the demos. We can we can talk about uh, some more, but let's go back to the um, to the presentation. So uh, on the line we have uh, we we design a system that we we think uh, can handle uh, uh, in the level of hundreds of millions of um, entities. So, um, so we have an offline database, we have an online store, and then we have the index and the API. Uh, on top of that, we have the our, our, uh, UI layer and the visualization layer, and then we, oh, by the way, we also have a Windows Phone 7 app that you can, you can download, uh, you, can, uh, you can run, so that in, the, for the, in this setting, you, you run to some person, you can quickly check out uh, his or her information, um, putting down the information from, and then show it up in the, mobile phone. And here's the uh, 
animation part. So how it works. So basically, we got um, three sources of our data. Uh, first of all, is the all the metadata we can get from uh, publishers. And um, secondly, the, the full text PDF. And then we have our colleagues working very hard with uh, various uh, publishers to um, uh, negotiate a, a collaboration so that we can get uh, the PDF data. And um, uh, we also uh, crawl the web for public publicly available PDFs. And then we also have um, uh, by text input and, and PDF links provided by authors. So we have we then we run a, a, a metadata extractor to extract all those metadata's paper, uh, title, author, date, uh, keywords, abstraction, uh, if possible references, and then we store them in our kind of a raw database. And then we know that most publications uh, papers they published in certain venue, either journals or conferences. So we have all that information as well. So that with that, uh, we call it venue integration, you know that, okay, this paper is published in SIGGRAPH, the other paper is published in, in, uh, in, in other, uh, sometimes in the um, conference proceedings, sometimes in journals, even though they, they, they look the same, they are two different instances of paper. But sometimes um, we have one, Paper, but they have lots of variations, right? The um, the draft, the author's own copy, and then the official copy from publisher. So you have to integrate them together. You uh, all those information go to a kind of a refined paper database, and then we did um, we we try to classify the domain, and then we try to uh, normalize the organization in the, uh, uh, that that uh, uh, list in the paper. Uh, the author's affiliation, and then we also uh, have a special module called author link club. Because we find out that uh, from the information we get from the internet, there is lots of noise, and then all papers in all domains, they are in so many different formats. Sometimes our metadata extractor just couldn't handle all these cases. We need to clean up a little bit. And, and with all this information, we ran into the module called author integration, so that the Michael Cohen can, can appear in different many uh, so many different uh, authentic uh, records. So with that information, we also uh, need to pick a name. So should we, call the, should, we, should we call this person Mike Cohen, or Michael Cohen, or Mike A. Cohen, or Mike F. Cohen? So uh, the, this module uh, this, uh, use um, some training data to decide. Sometimes the longest is not the best, actually. So uh, we have to pick the one that has the most frequency of, uh, of, of, of occurrence. And then um, also we also need to pick up the organization uh, names from, from this uh, data. Now we get the uh, refined authors database. Not, don't forget, we also have a lot of user input data. We need to combine them together so that we can run uh, our ranking model. Eventually, we, we generate a, um, a final DB. And then we have a very big module called store generator. It, it runs several hours to generate all those um, uh, compressed key value pairs. And then we build index uh, and index together with the data store uh, provide the online service so that uh, a user, either they call us from the web UI or they call us from the API from the mobile phone or they call us from the API from, uh, from someone who has written a, a little app, they can get this information and uh, fulfill their uh, user requirement. So this is the um, kind of the, the, the uh, underlying modules. So um, I still feel that is, this is uh, a little bit simplified <laughs> uh, because each, each, di each uh, little uh, object there, uh, we have about, uh, we have one owner, uh, usually a researcher or RSD working on it. And then there are uh, two or three interns uh, working on various aspects of, of that module. For example, metadata, metadata extraction, that is, uh, is a huge area that uh, constantly needs, needs improvement. Also, the author uh, integration, I'm going to uh, go down a little bit. For example, I mean, Michael Cohen, who is M. Cohen? Because we see papers that, which has uh, this information, and then uh, uh, who is that person? And uh, another paper also has Michael Cohen, M. Cohen 6. 
and another one is uh, called Michael Cohen too. I mean, are they, the, are they the same person or totally different person? Or the Mike is not really Mike, but uh, Matt Cohen. So we, uh, the algorithms um, are trying to take care of that. And of course, um, sometimes we have some very fun um, data. We thought that, well, usually uh, one paper, you have one author with the unique names, but sometimes we have two authors with exact same name that appear in the same paper and next to each other. Um, our module used to kill them and say, well, there must be something wrong, right? But I found out there are always exceptions to our, um, to our rules. So we have to uh, take care of these cases. So um, we run our pipeline, the, the, the animation that I just showed you, every 40, 48 hours. Um, so we have new data, so we have changes from, from users so that we, we just uh, keep them running. And then we also have a weekly process that we uh, process new PDFs. We have updates from conference journals. And sometimes if you have an urgent bug we need to fix, we also put it there. But uh, it doesn't happen that often. And also we have a, a weekly update. We, have, we scan the references. We, if you got new data from conferences, we also update uh, uh, people's homepage. Um, uh, for them, the scanning of uh, references is, is very uh, important. Because even if you get new papers, when you process, for example, let's say this week, this week you get uh, one million new paper, you can quickly find out that what other papers this paper has referenced because you get information. But you do not know that what are the existing 27 million papers if they, any of them, cite this paper, right? Then, because then you need, to, you, need to, you need to scan all those papers and find out, that, okay, this paper is really referenced by the other papers. Because we are not getting, always getting the new papers, uh, 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 always. Sometimes we, after we get papers from a reference, uh, from a publisher, we get a lot of old papers, or sometimes we get old papers from web. So we, we need to do that reference uh, matching work. And every three months, we call it a milestone. So the team, uh, in every three months, they have this uh, planning stage, implementation, and uh, QA, and then release stage. We design major features. We um, decide which new domains we are going to expand into. So. We just finished our last milestone, which we just released in uh, beginning of July, and then the next milestone will be the end of September or and beginning of August. <coughs> so above the hood. So when we first started, we thought, wow, it's great that we maybe we can build an end-to-end -end uh, scenario that from the moment you, you read paper, we need to download. And then when you write paper, you need, you need uh, reference tools, for example, uh, to help you write papers. And then when you, go to, when you uh, submit to a conference or a journal, you probably need some help there as well. We can, we can have a, a conference uh, a review system. And then when you go to the conference, you can have the Windows mobile phone to, so that you can to help you uh, know people. And then after you go to a conference, maybe you can, you can do some um, uh, surveys, and then we, we also want to design tools to help you. But then we found out that well, there are already a lot of people in the community doing this kind of work, right? Why should we do all this work for them? Uh, so we decided, say, decided that we should really focus on getting the data, and then, uh, pro but rather we provide an API so that uh, people in the community, in the neighborhood, right, can write, can, can really uh, write to us, uh, uh, think about other innovative ways to use our data and use our entity and use our uh, relationship information to help them address their problem. So uh, I think our, our colleague will talk about this more later. Uh, but right now, the uh, API is public. So you can, you can get, uh, let me just show you uh, something that as, um, you can go to the feedback link. The first uh, entry is the uh, Microsoft Academic Search API. You just need to fill in a very sh simple form to tell us uh, who you are and then what you are going to use this API for. And then uh, if you have a web page, uh, let us know. Then we give you uh, the API ID and, uh, so that we can, we can, you, can, you can use academic search to, to work on your own thing. And um, uh, all right, so that's, that's pretty much it. And, um, Alex. 
Right, thank you very much. Thank you, Jin. Uh, I think we have time for just one or two quick questions, and uh, I will ask for uh, people to look for, for the mic runners if, if we can, or wait for the mic, mic to come down. Uh, any questions for Jin? Alex, right here. Yeah, do you have plans to harvest other archives? So, for example, in physical sciences, the Harvard ADS archive is much more comprehensive than anything else, including ISI. And they have done an extremely thorough job over the last 20 years. So it might be better to go to them and uh, basically transfer some of their contents and citation counts. Uh, yes, actually, the question is about uh, do we have plans to uh, uh, get other data from, uh, from other archives, from archive the, for physics. Actually, we are getting the data. So if you look at the, uh, the physics tab, uh, uh, there are a lot of inf uh, data from, from archive. But uh, uh, we are in the middle of processing all this data, so okay. it might not be complete at this moment. Yeah, yeah. So I looked sort of in my field; it's about five percent complete right now. Yeah, so yeah. So, so we are we are working uh, hard on that. The just a quick point to that: we we actually have contacted um, the Center for Astrophysics, and we are that is in the queue. So we have that um, we have that coming, and there's. Uh, approximately 100 million publications that we have um, in the queue that will be folded in over the course of the next uh, six to 12 months. But that said, uh, if you are looking at it, and, and Jin sort of referred to the, showed the page here that has the 27 million publications on it, mm -hmm. um, that's about a 400% increase of where we were six months ago. As Lee said, we hope to, to do another fourfold increase on that. Feel free to let us know if you know very large sources of information. We're, we're working directly with, with publishers now to bring in publisher information as well as with uh, uh, large repositories of information. But uh, I, I, won't, I won't guarantee that we have a definitive list right now. So please contact us directly. One last question. OK. Well, uh, thank you very much, right, Jen. Thank you. Right. <laughs> And I think he, he, he set himself up or set us up very nicely to, uh, to segue into the next user, talking about the API uh, being something that we do to, to, to grow the neighborhood. And I think it's ironic that it was uh, right in our own backyard here from the University of Washington uh, that, that Jevin and the, the team at eigenfactor.org uh, were, were one of the groups who really sort of embraced this idea of us exposing this information via an API. And, uh, taking some of the existing work that they were doing, but seeing how the data that is in the Microsoft Academic Search Index uh, can start feeding into some of the other work that they were doing. So uh, please welcome Jevin West from the University of Washington. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Can I go on this one? <laughs> Perfect. OK, first of all, I want to thank Lee and Adnan and, and Alex and everyone who invited us to, to come over here. This is unusual. I didn't have to get on a plane and pack luggage or anything. I just had to drive across the lake, which was awesome. Um, yeah, so we are in the neighborhood. And we were really excited when we heard that this was going on across the lake. And we've been thinking about this for the last several years. I'm from the Department of Biology. So actually, my training, my PhD was in biology. And I do actually do biology stuff. I don't do as much pipetting and stuff. But what I do, what we do do in biology is we think a lot about networks, whether it's protein-protein interaction networks, we think a lot about ecosystem networks, we think a lot about gene networks. So we, uh, several years ago, we ran into this, this beautiful new model system that we've been, th been playing with a lot more than I would have ever thought we would have, which is citation networks. They're very well defined. They're, they're clean, they're readily available, and as researchers ourselves, they're very charismatic. They have a lot of interesting stories in there. And I would say over, in the time that we've worked on it over the last three or four years on citation networks, the field is really exploding. This field of bibliometrics, where all these papers that used to be in drawers or just even on pers a person's website or in these different repositories, they're now all coming together. So we have tens of millions of papers being linked together and hundreds of millions of citations that are telling us what's going on in this system. Where the flow of ideas going, where are they coming from. And so at first we wanted to do general things, just look at uh, general patterns of, of where ideas are going and where they're coming from. So this right here, this is a visualization we've had up for some time on eigenfactor.org. And we have a bunch of other visualizations that we'll be releasing hopefully over the next few months. But um, this, all, the, all you're looking at here are on the outside ring here, this represents 
uh, some of the major fields within science. This represents 400 journals. So the little, little boxes in here are journals, and then the outside are the fields. So this is ecology and evolution, my field, and then these are the individual journals. So if we go over like physics, I've clicked on physics, and then you look at the individual journals in physics. It's, there's about five million citations here, and all you're looking at here, I don't want you to look at anything specific, I'm just giving you the things that we kind of wanted to do at first. We wanted to get these 30,000 foot views of the, the flow of ideas between fields. So let's say I want to click on an individual journal within physics. I want to see, you know, where is, where is the flow of ideas coming and going from physical review letters? I think that's the one I clicked. Yeah. Or let's say I'm interested more in, let's say, let's click on this one, Lancet, medicine. Where are the fields going there? We can start to get an idea, or we can click on the entire field and see where this is going. Of course, we can, we can do all sorts of different permutations, but at first it was just kind of looking at this 30,000 foot view, getting an idea where the flow of ideas were, were going. And, and you know, there's lots of different projects I, I'd like to talk about today, but the one I'm, we're really pretty excited about is one that we're working with Microsoft Academic Search right now, and it is somewhere around here. It's this, and I'm gonna mainly try to get to this where we, we've um, kind of built four main, five kind of main tools here where we build a recommendation system and I'll go over that and we have some maps. We use these maps uh, just as you would to get from you know, SeaTac Airport to Building 33. How do you use maps to navigate, um, na navigate your landscape? And we want to navigate the scholarly landscape. So, and then we, um, then we have some new tools for exploring this, inf this data, and then we have our ranking and categorization, which is all based on this algorithm. So I am going to get to this, but I thought it would be useful to get to, um, to go to uh, a presentation just to give you a quick background of kind of what we're thinking, kind of where this comes from, and then I'll start demoing what we have. And this is all available. It all, it's all available. I just turned on the, the demo for, I, I need to switch to here. I don't know. Let's see. It's switching, I think. Aha, thank you. Okay, so, um, so I went through that. So really when people say the Eigenfactor Project, like I said, we are a, a, we're in a biology department, and really the question, the, there's, there's the algorithm, and that kind of overshadows the general project, but one of the, we go through, we, we're attacking lots of questions, but one of the first questions we tried to attack was how can we better, better evaluate the scholarly literature if we have all this new data that's being linked together? How do we... You know, how do we evaluate a journal? So if I'm an author and I want to figure out which journal I want to publish in, or you know, if there's a funding agency and they want to figure out these sorts of things, these are sort of questions, but that was kind of more just one basic question we wanted to get at. The stuff that we're really interested in is how does network structure affect function? That could be the function, the flow of ideas within the system, that could be in an ecosystem. Those are the general questions, and that's, that deals more with the general philosophy and this approach to building visualizations to seeing these sorts of things, and to, to, to get at understanding how that structure of the network affects function. So I'll just kind of go over four things briefly, pretty quickly today, because I'd really want to spend more time on the demo itself. But um, I'll talk a little bit about networks. A lot of computer scientists here. I don't need to go into too much detail on some of the, the, the mathematics or anything like that. But I'll give you just kind of uh, general concept ideas about what we're doing there. And then um, I'll talk a little bit about the algorithm, the algorithm that's kind of the, under the, kind of the main engine behind the mapping and the ranking and all those sorts of things. And then I'll get kind of to the, to the actual mapping stuff and the Microsoft Academic Search stuff. So citation networks, I think, are really cool. At first, you know, I just used them as any other researcher would do. I'd read papers, I'd go to some sort of citation, or I'd go to the references and I'd find an important paper or something that looked interesting. I'd take that citation and then I'd follow that to another paper and so on and so forth. I mean, I'm just kind of making the point that this is something that we do. It's an academic um, convention. But the cool, the, 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 the really neat byproduct of this convention is that we can scale up and we can look, we can look at these citations at a large scale now. We can start to get ideas um, where fields have started and where they're going and you can look at the collective movement of millions of scholars over time all the way back to Newton's. One of the databases we're working on has papers all the way back to Newton's time. We have Newton's papers in there and it's cool how you can watch how it percolates over time. So, my, my, the, the, kind of the general, again, I'm going to hit general concepts today. Scholarship really is about the flow of ideas, and also uh, the, the work we do in networks is all about the flow of information. So there are different kinds of networks. There's computer networks that, with actual hardware. There's networks, um, there's networks where uh, there are association networks. I'm going to talk about networks of flow, and this was recognized a long time ago. DeSolo Price wrote an article in Science in 1965 that said, you know, 
the scholarly literature forms this beautiful, vast network, and we can do all sorts of interesting things. And it's now just coming to fruition, his sort of dream at that time. And this, he obviously influenced Eugene Garfield and the, and, and the people at ISI and a lot of people that have been putting these great data sets together. Um, but now I think it's really in, in 2011 where we're really getting starting to do some of the things they would have loved to have done. So as you know, um, cit these citation networks can be aggregated among authors. And the thing that Microsoft Academic Search is doing so well that I've had to deal with over the last several years that it's really a tough thing is disambiguating authors. But when you do that, you can start to build networks um, where the authors are the nodes and the, and the edges are the links between those authors and the papers are aggregates. You can also uh, obviously make these citation networks where uh, the nodes are journals. This is something we've spent a lot of time on, those type of networks. They're, they're, they're the ones that are a little bit more readily available, but now we're working at the, the level where the nodes are papers and the edges are the citations between papers. So one of the challenges, of course, when you're dealing with these large, large networks um, is how do you scale up? I mean, of course, the numbers are much bigger than this, but this is the first data set we worked on. It was 12,000 nodes in this network, and there were 50, 150 million citations among those. And scaling up is not an, uh, not an easy thing to do, um, not just because uh, you, know, you have to have big servers and big data sets, but you know, if, you, if, if you just try to, to look at the, the nodes around one individual node, that's about what we've done over the last 100 years. And so now we're moving beyond that and doing more interesting things. So um, really, if you do scale up, this is the sort of thing that it looks like. Of course, it's a black screen. I'm trying to represent, if you tried to put these all on one screen, you can't really get, there's nothing you can get from that story. So really one of the essence, kind of one of the themes of what we've done over the last several years is, is doing kind of just what you don't think. We're actually trying to figure out what information to remove, what information to compress, what information to filter. These are the sort of questions when we're building and designing algorithms or, or with visualizations. What do we remove to make sh so we can move to maps of science like this? So the first question we really were interested in, like I said, like I said at the beginning of the, the talk, is how do we identify important journals? That's what, now we do other things. Now how do we identify important papers and lots of other things? But if we, we started with a really, really simple question, but we had a caveat. And this was just kind of the point I want to make. The whole point of this whole talk part, before I get into the demo, is that we're interested in the network. That's different than what's been done so far. And, in the history, and if you look at the history of bibliometrics, that's been what's kind of been ignored or just hasn't been able to be um, approached. So the caveats were we wanted to identify important nodes using only the citation network, but all of the citation network. This isn't new. Again, a lot of people that teach computer science courses do this sort of stuff all the time when they try to explain page rank or these other things. But network effects is it's a big th it, it's a it's it's something that we we've spent a lot of time thinking about, and this is kind of uh, the point of this is what where our uh, our approach to mapping comes from. So I usually go through an explanation of what I mean by centrality. I think I might skip this and go into um, um, spend more time on the demo. But basically, this is, I mean, I'll just say it real briefly, and then I won't go through the details of it. But this is a real network. Um, of high school students in a Michigan high school. And the blue dots represent um, boys and the pink dots represent girls. These are real relationships among them. And um, the reason why I put this up is, first of all, there are certain visualization, visualizations you can immediately tell what's going on. And it's much more interesting than if you had it in tabular form. And, but also, in addition to showing this visualization, I want to explain the importance of centrality. But that's the part I'm going to skip, and, I, and then I, I, I make it so you pretend you're a pathogen to, today, but we won't do that. You won't pretend you're mono. So, um, but I'm going to skip this, and I'm just, I just talk about centrality and eigenvector, um, kind of what centrality is, what degree centrality is, and, and our approach. So really, kind of the main thing that I go through in this sort of thing is that, you know, this is, this is a degree centrality approach where you jump around the network and you sample. And then you count how many edges are coming into that particular node. And then that, you can tell the stories that way. But that's not really our approach. If you count for the network, you want to take into account the entire network. So the point is um, that the network matters. And this is kind of the key, key point that I want to make. In if, if you haven't read the history of bibliometrics, which you probably haven't, um, but uh, the network property of the scholarly literature was largely, not all, because there was papers that were written about this and people understood that, but it had been largely ignored over the first century in, in terms of the evaluation side. So one of the things that we want to do, and not just in bibliometrics, but in the other kinds of 
uh, data sets we're working with. In, f in fact, we're working, we're now uh, been approached by the federal uh, banks and we're looking at the flow of money between banks and trying to see what happened during the Lehman Brothers drop and that's been really interesting data. That paper will be coming out of our lab hopefully in the next month, which is really super interesting. Um, but we really want to just be able to, how do, we, um, how do we extract this information? How do we extract this information flow? So since I am going to talk about eigenfactor, I need to uh, mention impact factor for those that uh, most everyone knows what impact factor is. It's not the most popular term in, in, in academics and in research. But uh, for those that don't know what it is, it's a way of measuring the impact of journals. And it's been used for in, uh, trying to evaluate uh, faculty when they're going up for tenure and promotion. It's used for uh, funding. It's used for things that probably shouldn't be used for. But that wasn't Eugene Garfield's intent originally. He just simply wanted a, a measure that he could figure out which journals to keep in his database so that he could do um, research on the frontier. He wanted to do basically the sorts of things that are now happening today. And I actually just recently talked to him at a conference a month ago, and he's actually really excited about all this. He doesn't really care about impact factor and all these things. But basically, the impact factor is a measure where you take all the citations in, let's say, 2010, and you look at those citations to articles in 2009 and 2008. So you look at all those citations in that window, that two-year window, and then you divide by the number of articles in the two previous, those same two years. That gives you a measure. But based on this thing I've told you about taking into account the whole network, um, uh, the way to think about impact factor is, let's say you wanted to calculate the impact factor of plant physiology. This is a journal. Sometimes they do it for papers and, 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 um, or, or for individuals, which they sh it's, again, the, this is where it gets, you get into big trouble, but I'm just going to do it for journals here. If you wanted to calculate the impact factor of plant physiology, it's very simple. You look at all the citations. Let's say it got three citations in this window. It wrote two articles, so its impact factor would be 1.5. This is the point I'm making. It's a very simple point but I don't I, I want to keep hitting it home, that's impact factor. It doesn't take into account the source of those citations. So this is impact factor. Again, it's this sampling and just count the edges on the node. Um, eigenfactor um, and the approach that we're taking, not just for the uh, metrics that we do to evaluate those nodes, whether they're authors or journals or institutions or papers, but we take into account the entire network. So that gets me through right now. I'm jumping right now just kind of to the algorithm. It's a, bit, it's a big messy thing. I'm not going to go into that. Of course, I'd rather just show you. I'm going to switch back to um, this other screen. I don't know if anyone, let's see, can I switch it? Oh, there we go, PC1, perfect. So just, this is just gives you a general concept. Again, I'm hitting the same point. I'm talking about a little bit about the algorithm, but I'm also hitting this point that if, you're gonna, if we're going to do some of this cool, interesting stuff with all this cool, new, interesting data that Microsoft App Academic Search is bringing out with all these other repositories, let's, let's take into account the whole network. So basically, the way the algorithm works, and I can also show you how our mapping works. So um, this is, uh, again, you can go to Eigenfactor and click on the, the front view, and it'll take you to mapequation.org. But this will show you how our maps uh, uh, work. This is just, uh, so right now I'll just do the simplest one. Many of you teach this. You can, all, you can use this too if you ever want to teach students what page rank. It's very similar to page rank. There are some differences. But basically all I'm going to show you here is, let's say that we wanted to figure out, we want to evaluate the importance of each one of these nodes here. And we have this network and they're weighted edges. So you can pretend these nodes are, let's say, journals. And the edges between them are the number of citations. So if you wanted to then, and then this right here, I'm just going to keep track of how the, we're going to play a game, how, who accumulates the most amount of votes. So, so first I'm just going to initialize. I'm going to, we're going to play a game. Basically what we're trying to do is evaluate, and I'm showing you how the algorithm works. I'm not going through the mathematics. I'm just showing you how it works. So what you do is you can think of this, uh, each one of these nodes, uh, like I said, as a journal. And I'm gonna, we're gonna, each journal is going to vote based on their, um, based on whether there's an arrow going. So this particular journal right here has two links out. So it, on a vote, it's going to give part of its credit to this one and part of its credit to this one. So I'll show you. So if they vote, you'll watch. And then you start to accumulate. This is, there, there's actually two ways of, of interpreting how the algorithm works. This is the this, this deterministic view, but there's also a stochastic way of uh, interpreting how the algorithm works. And I'm just showing you this, not because I can get to the demo, but I think it's kind of important to understand what's at the root of a lot of the, the things that we're doing. So if we vote again, you see that the nodes, the size of the nodes actually change, because this one right here, as you see, is accumulating a lot of, um, a lot of the voting. 
credit. And if you let this go for a very, very long time, of course, many of you know that this converges to a stationary distribution. And that stationary distribution, doesn't matter where you start, will give you, it will converge to this score, as you can see. And now there's other ways that you can, you can explain this to. Um, we can actually do uh, a rate view. Um, we can do a random walker view. So this is the stochastic view. We can reset. And it's just another thing. You can just pretend you go to the library and uh, you pick up a random journal, a random article. You find a random citation. And then you go to the next one and you just follow this. Many of you, again, know this. Um, but if we step through and we just let this thing go, you're going to come to the exact same stationary distribution, which is, which is kind of useful. But anyway, so that's just kind of, that gives you an idea of what the algorithm works. If, if I have time, I'll also show you how the map equation works. So then it explains how we cluster and how we build these maps that I'll show. OK, so now I'm going to go back to the presentation and then to the demo. OK, so that was just that. I was just kind of going over some of the details of that. That's the applet. It was built by our collaborators in Sweden. They're actually visiting us in a couple of weeks, Daniel Elder and Martin Roswell. Um, Right, so then you get a, so when you do this sort of exercise and, you, um, and you, you, you run this algorithm, then you can rank, let's say, journals. And th this is, these are actual rankings in 2008 for Nature. So um, the eigenfactor score for Nature in that case um, would be, you know, one, if you were to take this random walk, you would spend, you know, 1.76% of your time at Nature, which is a pretty high considering that there's 10,000 journals in this particular data set that we ran this on. Um, also, we have a, what's called an article influence. And that gives you, basically, you take the eigenfactor, you divide by the number of articles, it normalizes by the size, and you get scores. These are actual scores in 2008. These are journals. Of course, this is all available at eigenfactor, but the new thing is moving on um, too. So this, is, this stuff's available at eigenfactor. We have been wanting to release over the next, we've been wanting to do it this, by this summer. We're going to release the new site with all the new tools, not just the ranking of journals, um, which is going to include some of the stuff that we're doing with uh, Microsoft Acronym Search. You can see these rankings in the journal eigenfactor score over here. You can see these. Um, they're uh, in the JCR now. Thompson now has adopted eigenfactor sc the eigenfactor scores. Um, so now the, the, here's, the, there's, here's the part where it starts to get kind of exciting, too. That, not that that wasn't exciting. That's really where we, we get asked a lot of questions because people care about these rankings. And now that the JCR just recently came out, the JCR is the journal citation reports that ISI puts out that has these impact factors. And now they have eigenfactor scores. But really, what we're really excited about is how can we use this approach? How can we use this network approach to help scholars find important papers? That's really what we're mostly interested in. It's not about ranking. To be honest, I know there's a lot of issues with ranking. And, and I'm one of those people that have, uh, we have, there's a lot of issues associated with ranking. But what we're excited about is using these sorts of same tools to help scholars find the papers that maybe they should be reading, but they haven't been reading. So the, the, kind of the, the, the kind of concept that, or the, the idea that, that kind of pushes through a lot of the research we're doing with this sort of stuff is that we think that good maps simplify. They don't just put in all that, the, basically the black screen. We don't want the black screen, or we don't want every single s superfluous uh, uh, detail in these maps. We want to simplify and highlight relevant structures. So this is the map equation. Since I, I'm, I'm, I want to get to the demo, if I have time, I'll explain the map equation. Do the same thing. But the idea is we build these sorts of maps. This is a real map, a real map. They're all real maps. But this is a map of uh, science uh, using, this, this includes about uh, 60 million citations and about 8,000 journals. The nodes here represent entire fields. And the links between them represent the flow of ideas among fields. And so you get these interesting, I mean, actually, when we first built this, we thought it would be a circular thing, and it, and it wasn't quite. But we see that general medicine, molecular biology, chemistry, and general physics kind of form this backbone. And then you see, um, then you see the different fields that, that burst out. And actually, we now have the ability to zoom in and zoom out of these nodes. Uh, we have the visualization now where you can, you can actually jump into general medicine, zoom, zoom in, and look at the individual fields. And then eventually, using maybe data like Microsoft Ap Academic Search's data with authors, go all the way down to the authors. So at this point, we can go down to individual subfields and even papers. So um, the, uh, the big challenge that we've had over the last year is building hierarchical maps of science. Again, this is mainly work done by Martin, who's been a collaborator uh, in our lab. And this is basically the idea of doing this this uh, doing it hierarchically, which just means you have superfields and subfields after that. So one of the challenges, though, and this is what I think is exciting based on the data we have, is being able to do things like look over time. 
So one of the things we did when we started making these maps of science, we realized, man, it's hard to tell any difference. If we wanted to find out what's, going, what's happened between, let's say, 1995 and 2004, we couldn't, it was really, it's really tough. I mean, our eyes have this, we have this enormous amount of bandwidth at picking out patterns in, in, um, in images, but this was, this was a little bit too hard. So you can see there are differences. You can see that psychology and education and psychiatry and neuroscience have formed a little tighter um, uh, cluster over there, but it's not so much in here. But, but really the hard part was being able to tell what was different here. So, um, uh, our lab came up with what's called an alluvial diagram, and this is one example, and this is one of the more interesting stories. But what you're seeing here are these individual, so this is, these are two maps here. Now pretend, oops, sorry, so pretend you, we did a map for 2001, 2003, 2005, and 2007. Each one of those blocks represents um, an in, one of those individual ma maps, and then we've just kind of compressed it so that each one of the blocks themselves are a cluster. You, sorry, you can't see, but you have like, by, uh, psychology and psychiatry and neuromedicine. You can't quite see it all there. But the point is, I just want to say that now we have ways to look at how these maps are changing over time. And this was one story. There's lots of stories that are popping out. It's really interesting based even just on this data set. But it turns out what's interesting is that neuroscience over the last uh, decade or so has formed this standalone uh, field, which it didn't, if you look at the citation network, it wasn't a standalone field. But you see that they were separate. There was a lot of uh, activity in like medicine and molecular biology and then psychiatry and neurology. And then we've seen um, this, this convergence into this standalone field. But we're seeing these sorts of things in other data sets as well. So now, now to the demo part for um, what we're working with with Microsoft Academic Search. So really the question I started kind of the presentation was how can we better evaluate the scholarly literature has really shifted more now to how we, can we better navigate. How can we use the maps, how can we use the metrics to be able to, to really maybe speed up even an, an epsilon amount uh, the, the, the formation of new ideas and, and, and bringing uh, and finding papers that maybe you didn't find. So that's really what we're interested in. So one of the things, we were actually working on several other different projects too, but we're working with um, Microsoft Academic Search using their API to build some of these tools. So uh, this is the site temporarily. It's going to be changed over the next two weeks where we put it up completely live, but there's no password on there now. You can go play around with this right now. I think I spelled that right. Um, if it's not, come get me afterwards and I'll get you the right URL. Um, okay, so now I need to go back to here. And we'll go to, here we go. So there's lots of things that this is, can do. I'm not going to go through every little thing, but um, for example, as a, as a researcher myself, one of the things I've really appreciated, it's kind of like I've appreciated some of the new music services that have come out. I used to collect so many CDs, even uh, records when I was young, and 8-tracks and, and tapes. And I could navigate the music literature pretty, pretty well um, just by going to the store and talking to people. Um, but now there's these nice services like Pandora and all these other things that have come about where they actually, they've done some pretty good uh, algorithmic design and, and I can put in a song that I like and then they can give, they can output um, something that's related. Well this is similar, I mean obviously the, the algorithm is completely different, but the idea is similar. Let's say um, I, I know that Kleinberg does really good research and he does. Um, uh, and so I can go into the database. This is, uh, this is again, this is uh, built off the API that uh, Microsoft Academic Search built. And um, then we can say, okay, these are the top papers that Kleinberg has written and it orders it in important. So let's go to his most important paper. That, well, at least it says this is one of his more important papers, but maybe let's go down to something not as important. I don't know, we'll just navigation in a small world. It was in nature, so I guess it was important. Um, whoops, actually, I hit it wrong. Let's go back here. This is uh, still in a very, it's not even beta, it's still alpha, but we'll, we'll try it again here. We'll just pick the top one, I guess. So what it does is it will give you um, an expert recommendation, a classic, and a hot, and we have all these different sort of recommendations that you can get. So if you have read this authoritative sources in, in a hyperlink environment, and you're an expert in the field, um, using some of uh, our algorithms, it says if you're an expert in the field, let's say you've been working in the field for some time, it gives you um, this particular paper. Now sometimes you will get a blank, like you saw on the screen before, you had a blank. It won't give you uh, a recommendation if it's not, if it's in a really, really small subfield. And uh, we haven't populated this with all the data. This is just computer science. So in the next couple of weeks, we want to have all of the domains that Microsoft Academic Search has. So you'll be able to explore all the fields that they have. And as they grow, we grow. 
Um, so what that does, and then the classic recommendation would be some, something, let's say a graduate student comes into the field and needs to read the key paper in that area. Um, it'll give you a recommendation uh, based on that. And we also have the ability, we'll have the ability to, you can um, expand these lists, of course. And then it, a hot, the hot recommendation is something that's in this little subfield um, of this paper that you're interested in, and, um, but is a more recent paper. So this, this gives you that. And then we have this kind of fun one, because we're going to actually do some experiments on this, looking at usage, and let the, usage, the users themselves tell us which um, recommendations are good and which aren't good. But we have a serendipity search, which is within the same subfield of the map, but um, it's just a random um, kind of it's basically a random within the field. So it's related. It has relations within the citation tree. So there's a recommendation. We'll also have um, the maps themselves. We'll have some maps based on the data. And this, the, the, the number of maps will have basically an infinite number. You can select what you want to choose. But this is um, a small little map that I chose this morning. I put in there. Actually, this is one I've had in there, but I'm putting, I, I think I pulled this one just because we know that it works. This is, this is a, a really like, very 30,000-foot uh, view of, of the data that Microsoft Academic Search has in computer science. So you have these, um, these different subfields. You're not able, OK, there you go. So and in these, let's say you're interested in theory. Let's say you're, th uh, and actually I should say, these nodes represent entire subfields within the, the corpus that they have. And then the flow of ideas. So you can see that there's a flow between discrete mathematics and computer science. And let's say I'm interested in discrete mathematics. I can click on discrete mathematics. And these are the individual um, journals within this field. And you can click on the journals, and that'll take you there. Uh, um, and then you can also, let's say, oh, I, I'm interested in you know, how, let's see. There are, what's, what's kind of interesting about these things is that sometimes there's only uh, unidirectional um, arrows, that they only kind of go one way. You see that computational biology gets a lot of its ideas from information theory. And actually, I know that because that's my field. Um, so, I've, so maybe I'm in computational biology. And I said, oh, I want to find out what journals I should be reading. So that's at the journal level. Of course, you can do this at the author level. We're doing this. We can do it at the paper level. So you can also go into to papers themselves. Um, and again, this is a small subset. But eventually, this is going to expand to everything. These are the top subfields in their, in their corpus. Let's say you're interested in uh, probabilistic encryption. Also, this gives you kind of a percentage of flow that goes through based on what they've had over the years and what their fields represent. But you can click on, and there's the individual papers. And we don't have them hot linked yet, but those will take you directly to the papers if you're interested in those things. Um, also, uh, if you are interested just, in, just simply in the ranking part, and you just want to know what the top papers or the top journals based on our algorithm, um, and of course, uh, this doesn't have to be just our algorithm, but this is, we, we've actually found some pretty good results. But these are the journals. Let's say you're interested in chemical information, or just go back down to discrete mathematics. They're all, of the, they're all ranked by the number of um, citations. You can click, uh, these are all the, the particular journals in that subfield. But let's say this is a field you don't know much about, health information, you can go there. So those are some of the things you can do. Um, it also does, uh, one of the big things, one of the challenges in bibliometrics has been categorization, automatically categorizing. And so we use semantic information. We use title information. And um, we've also used uh, some of the abstract information to give us ideas of what is in indi each individual field. So let's say you're interested in action recognition and human actions. That, these are some papers, the top papers in that particular, those keywords. So we're trying to figure out ways of automating the classification. So when we build these maps, it can automatically label all those nodes, because it's not going to be 30 or 40 nodes. It's going to be 30 or 40,000 nodes. Um, so we need to find ways to automate that. But those are the main things. Um, we also have a, a new exploration tool that, that you, can, you can move around this um, particular map in and out. And uh, that's still kind of under development. I haven't really touched it for the last three weeks, but I hope to get to that soon. But the main idea is that uh, we're using this, this API that Microsoft Academic Search is, is, uh, has built. And I think others should use it, too. It's, it's, I think it's exciting for the field. I also think that uh, for us, it's really exciting because we like data. We don't collect the data. We, we use other data sources. We've worked with JSTOR. We've worked with uh, Thomson Reuters with their data set. We've worked with ADS. We've worked a little bit with the archive. We've worked with all these different data sources. And we're really excited that Microsoft's taking this seriously. I think the academic. Um, the, the meetings that I've been going through uh, to all summer have been really excited about hearing some of these things. Um, I think it's going to be great for uh, improving scholarly communication. So that's all I have. But if there's questions you have, there's lots of other things I can talk about. But I blasted through probably too much for this in one presentation anyway. So thanks yeah. for your time. Thank you. Yeah.
Wonderful. Thank you. Um, just time for a couple quick questions, and I'll ask Adnan to come up and, and get set up. Uh, Ed? The microphone right behind you. Yeah. Uh, a lot of us teach courses, and yes. it would be nice when people teach courses to have better access to the right papers to use in seminars, for example. Also, ACM and IEEE are now starting CC TS 2013 to redo all the curriculum. It would be nice for that actually to be informed by something besides people's whims. Awesome. Uh, and we'd love for you to beta test it. So, yeah, if we could, if we send me an email and actually, we, we have actually, I will say this, it's, this isn't just like fresh. We've had it up for several months and we've had, we've had people, um, we've gotten a lot of usage feedback and it's been extraordinarily good. Sometimes we get the recommend, or some feedback like, why would you ever put this stupid paper up there? You know, there, are, there is that sort of thing, but I would love to get feedback on how we can improve it, because it's built there, so we can tweak things, and that's what I'm learning about how this whole developing these, the, at least the recommendation system, how do we do that? But I think at least for your class that I've noticed, I've been using some of the classes I've been um, t t being a part of the teaching, is that the maps themselves are kind of useful too. So you can zoom in and you can say, oh, well, this area connects to this area. It gives them, it gives them at least um, an idea of what the landscape looks like. So send me an email. I'll send you all the stuff we have. We'd love to have it tested in a class. That would be fantastic. And we'll just take this one last one here, uh, try and keep us on track, and, uh, and I'll make sure that Jevin stays around for the break yeah, so we can definitely. corner him. Uh, hi. Um, so I'm really impressed with the uh, with the strong interest in interdisciplinarity, and that's one of the things I'm I'm highly invested in as a researcher. I'm kind of curious, though, in in the in the push towards this kind of publication um, exploration, where the arts and humanities fall. Good question. Because they're, they're, the flow of scientific ideas is increasingly exchanged, yep. and artists are using transgenic approaches in their work and yep. working with biology. And when they publish in academic papers, it goes. If scientific papers, it goes this way. What about that kind of hole? <laughs> Absolutely. It's a great question, and it's something that I, it, there's a whole story behind this, so we should talk about this afterwards. But um, we, we've been actually working specifically now with humanity, people that are putting at least how they see their world put together, whether it's not, it's not, not always through a manuscript, it's not always through a monograph or a book even. So um, we're, one of them, the groups are working with is JSTOR. So JSTOR has a much better representation of the humanities and arts and, and, and uh, biblical research and classical studies and all these other areas that usually just kind of get overwhelmed with, you know, if you look at a network, the whole, you know, like life sciences completely just swamps it. So we're working specifically with them and they're actually doing some really neat ways of archiving um, certain kinds of information. It, we have to somehow quantify the information, but we've been working with them and we're also working with a, uh, we're starting a, a, a collaboration with a group in, in, in Copenhagen that's specifically got funding to work on the humanities to look at the humanities and see what, what's going on, you know, regardless of what's going on in the, in the science world, this, to, to, to show how they're affecting this, this, this sort of landscape that we talk about. But yes, definitely. And if you have ideas, we'd love to, because I'd love to push that. I have my own reasons for that. So. Great. Again, thank you very much, Jevin. I appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks. Okay, the final speaker of this morning's session is Adnan Mahmoud, who is a program manager on uh, the Microsoft Academic Search Project. Take it. Thanks, Alex. All right, um, I don't have a demo, so I'm going to try to zoom through this very quickly so we can finish up here on time. Um, my name is Adnan Mahmoud. I'm a program manager with Microsoft Research, um, and I work on Academic Search Project as one of few projects that I work on. Uh, I'm based out of Redmond, but I um, work with the China Lab frequently. So four things I'm going to talk about today, uh, really it's about what's coming next. Um, you've seen our website, you've seen some of the very cool work that Jevons Group is doing with their APIs. So I'll touch on four areas um, very quickly. So data coverage, scenarios we're looking at, um, our story for extensibility is more on the APIs and where that's going. And then kind of came back, finishing up on partnerships, um, which was mentioned earlier about ADS and some of the other partners as well. So I'll touch on that a little bit. Uh, so data coverage. Uh, our next target, uh, Lee mentioned, 100 million papers. We're at 27 right now. We're trying to get to 100 um, and over 20 domains. Um, so hopefully that um, will make it a lot more interesting when you think about some of the work that Jevin is doing on maps uh, and um, eigenfactor or influence measurement. But not just increasing the numbers, we want to look about um, look into quality as well. So we're going to be looking hard at some of our internal technologies at Microsoft Research. What can we bring to bear to improve the quality of um, the services as in general? So 
the quality of the author name disambiguation work we're doing, um, just Shin mentioned uh, the work we're doing around uh, normalization of organization names as well. So, so we'll leverage some of our MSR technologies, and then also we'll improve our um, ex user experience for input. So, if you are a user, you want to edit your your information. Shin showed how you can do that um, through the website. We believe there's a lot of room for improvement on that aspect as well. Um, so we will be focusing on that uh, in the future. Scenarios. These are the f scenarios that we will work on um, in the next few months. First, um, completeness. So if you look at computer science domain in our website, you'll see there's a lot of very cool, cool features. And if you look at some of the other domains, you might notice that not all of the features um, are available in the other domains yet. So our, one of our top priorities is to make sure there's consistency in the experience across all domains. One of the really fun things that I think this, uh, this service will enable is cross-domain analysis. So can we connect biology with physics, with um, computer science, so people, researchers who have papers in mathematics or, and physics and um, biology, for example? Can we show those interesting um, connections um, across authors, across organizations? We want to make the data more accessible, so thinking about can we make, what, what's the story around when, if you're in your um, library, in your organization, you come to academic search, you find some papers you're interested in, you click to, through to them, and your library has access to those um, repositories. So how do we make that available in a seamless way to the user? We'll look at that. We want to go beyond co-authorship. So when Shin did his demo, he showed you uh, the graph view of had given an author, here are all the other people he has co-authored with. And that's really the tip of the iceberg. We think we can do much, much more than just showing um, who are the people you've worked with. So there's some really interesting work. For example, could you show, given an author, who are the other people he has uh, influenced, so to speak, or has mentored, right? So kind of like the genealogy of research, so to speak. So we think we can, that's an example of something that's beyond just a co-authorship. And that leads to the next point, which is, what is influence in research? How do you measure that? Um, it comes down to some sort of ranking. Today, we have a very basic ranking where we say we rank by citation count, and that's it. But really, is that the best we can do? And we think we can do a bit better than that. And again, we're going to be looking at how do you measure influence? Um, Jevin touched, touched on that as well on their version you know, using the eigenfactor. Um, we want to obviously enable more of those uh, with the APIs where you, anyone can come up with their own influence metrics. Um, so, so, so that's also something we're planning on. So that's the scenario side. Let's look at extensibility. <coughs> Cloud Plus Client is a big deal f um, for us. Service is going to be online. Um, it's a website, but we have the APIs. Shin mentioned we have a phone client already, but we, don't want, um, we want to actually enable the whole ecosystem to build their own clients as well. So you can imagine there are people out there who want to build a desktop client or a tablet client. Um, Jevin is a great example of someone who has built a web client running on our data. We want to, uh, for the APIs, we will continue working on them. Uh, we just released our first version just a couple of weeks ago with our latest release, but that's really the first stab at it, we will be working with the community, all of you guys, and look, listening to your feedback and figuring out what are the next um, things we want to add to the APIs. And in general, we'll continue to f invest in making sure that they're simple to use, they're reliable, they deliver the service uh, on a high quality, and then they're scalable, right? So we're talking about hundreds of millions of paper, um, which would probably reach to maybe a billion or so. <laughs> Um, citations if you look at it. So how do we make sure we serve that up in a um, scalable manner to hundreds or thousands of applications calling them? So that those are the things we'll be looking at in terms of the APIs. And then finally, encouraging the ecosystem. So this is where we uh, will go on and talk to the publishers and making sure that we work with them, making their data available through us to all of you so that you guys can focus on building the experiences and the rankings and the tools uh, and not have to worry about um, talking to the publishers and, and getting permissions to use their data. Hopefully, we can we can take care of that. So there's more. Um, it's easier for you guys. 
So which leads me to partnerships. We'll continue working with publishers, repositories, libraries, academics. Um, as Lee mentioned, we already have over 100 million papers on the pipeline waiting to get on. Um, those are the people we've already talked to. Um, ADS was mentioned. Those are one ex example of a publisher we are talking to. We hope we'll get them, um, we'll get them signed on relatively quickly. Um, and then, oops, sorry. And then we'll look at some very strategic collaborations, case by case. So, uh, how many of you guys have heard of ORCID initiative? Not spelled Not... that way. Oh. Without the H. Oh, sorry, sorry, without the H. <laughs> <laughs> um, so ORCID is an initiative being, um, it's, some of the publishers have come together and repositories have come together, Microsoft is a part of it, um, where we're trying to figure out if we can uh, create a unique identifier for each researcher. So if that does come to fruition, then you can imagine the academic search will leverage um, those IDs um, to, um, through our service and make it available, uh, expose it on our website and as well as on our APIs. So again, um, we talked about the, our future for the data coverage scenarios and then some of the extensibility stories and um, where we're going with our partnerships. So I'll wrap up with just one question, which is, so now that you know what academic search is about, you've seen an example of someone using our APIs and where we're going, how many of you are interested in trying it out and playing with it? So look around, and I think that shows where the future of this service is. It's all of you guys um, taking it and playing with it and coming with interesting stuff. So thank you. Great. Uh, questions for Adnan? Right in the middle, in the back here. Microphone's coming your way. In fact, I'll, I'll even invite Jevin and, and general questions. Yeah, Jen to come up as well. We'll we'll take questions uh, for for anybody. We've got about 10, 15 more minutes. So if there's more questions, so in the back. Great. So this is a uh, kind of more of a comment for the the last two speakers, and it's an observation on on impact. Um, you know. It's very clear that computer science has had a, a tremendously profound impact across all of the sciences, but this impact is not something that really is visible in the citation networks. And similarly, even within computer science, there's often um, you know, impacts and, and uh, projects which have had such a profound impact that they're like actually not cited anymore. You know, when people say like I posted my paper on the web, they don't say like web citation Tim Berners-Lee, you know, original paper on the World Wide Web, right? It's such a profound impact. It's such a part of the ecosystem that people just like they just know it. And so there's a sense in which citation networks are kind of showing you like small to medium size impacts. Mm -hmm. And once you get to very large, profound impacts, they just don't even show up in citation networks anymore. So I think it's, um, there certainly is impact that's shown in citation networks, but that's not all the impact. And I think sometimes they, they miss the really big and profound impacts. Let Jeff yep. start with that. Oh, I can. Or I can just, I can speak loudly too. Um, it's, it, it's working. Oh, it is? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. So I'll, I won't speak loudly then. Um, it's, a, it's a really good point. And, and what's interesting, here's, here's, here's what's almost ironic. When we, we look at uh, citation networks, a lot of times if there is something that's completely overwhelming and it's completely changed so much, it swamps out some of the other signals. So sometimes you'll actually remove that. So let's just say you wanted to look at just journal citation network. If you do that, sometimes or you want to remove things like nature, science, PNAS, because it just swamps the whole thing and it's all connected and it messes, it messes it up. So with that sort of approach, that's even driving home your point even more. You're right, citation networks can't give you everything. And it's something that we need to take into consideration for the field itself. My feeling about it is, you're right, there are things that uh, we, we don't get all the information like with blogs or you know, a lot of times people just rely on citation data and don't even read the papers. I was, I was on a, as a, when I was a graduate student, I was on a committee, and I'm not, I won't name names, but they, there were several people that hadn't even read the papers of the people they were evaluating. Only thing they were doing was looking at some of these metrics. And we can't do that as a, as a community. Um, it, it has a, that has a, a poor impact. But I think that my attitude about it is that there's all this new interesting data coming on board. We might as well look at it at these large scales, uh, but we need to take into consideration that it's not the whole story for sure. So I completely agree with you. 
And as Jevin said at the beginning, their, their focus with this project is to look at the citation networks and, and you know, what more can they mine out of that data. There are other efforts underway. Um, Johan Bolan at Indiana has been doing some very interesting work on looking at usage patterns. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the easiest thing to actually get a hold of and to aggregate together. So uh, one of the projects that came, uh, one of the papers that came out of the measure project was looking at the usage pattern information from uh, the entire UC system and a number of other institutions in California. Um, again, the problem with citation yeah. networks is the latency of them that you don't necessarily get with, with usage patterns. Uh, if there was a way of, of aggregating all that data together, there, there are some other, other measures that come into play there. And actually going along with what, uh, what Alex is saying, we actually have a grant, a mutual grant with Johan Bolin. So we have a uh, National Science Foundation gave us a grant to look at uh, kind of the relationship between download and usage information and citations. And as you would expect, we are getting a different picture. So this is just another nice case, case study or an example of how you know, citations don't provide all that information. So the, real, the, the point of the study was to figure out you know, when you build maps using, let's say, just the usage data and just the citation data, what are the differences, where did they come from, and what else can they tell us? In the back over yeah, here. Question here. Um, oh, so I just wonder whether there's any effort made to normalize different fields of the research. For example, everything you show up, or biology all goes up, mathematics really come down. Mm -hmm. And that has something to do with the fact that in particular field, people to cite a lot more in their publications than other. So I think it would be important to have some work done here or there. Absolutely. They might normalize different field. I just wonder uh, mm -hmm. your experts would have any thought on that. I'll take that one. Um, so yes, so that's absolutely true that we are, we are trying to normalize the fields. Um, so if you if you look at again this example is if you look at computer science, you will notice that um, we have even subdomains under computer science. Um, and for some of the other like physics, we have subdomains as well. But we haven't gotten that level of subdomains for all the domains yet. But we are definitely looking at how do we how do we add more details into, into those domain level information? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and going along with that too, just the, the, I didn't have enough time to really drive home the point, but that's one of the issues with degree centrality measures like impact factor. Because there are uh, citation culture differences between let's say biochemistry and even economics, you're gonna see wide differences and they've been hit hard by impact factor over several decades because of these differences. And so one of the approaches when you take into the network, it does correct for those things partially, it doesn't correct for it fully, but when you take into account the source of the network, more, uh, fields that are more frugal with their citations, like economics and mathematics, do rise through these metrics that take into account the net, uh, network. And it's not just our metrics people are working on this so, too, but there are other groups as well um, that are trying to work on this idea that you're talking about. Yeah. Sorry. Do you have the microphone there yet? So I'm sorry. Uh, over, over here, and then we'll get the mic to you afterwards. Thank you. I'm, so I'm pleased to hear you considering more sources of impact. Some of us who've been looking at it for a while have some suggestions. Uh, people have a great deal of influence that doesn't always come through citations, so the more you include those. Some people have very few citations, but through um, a lot of the social media, I mean thousands and thousands of people are influenced by them. And another source I don't think people have really looked at is the number of times that papers are included in syllabuses. So you take a That's paper a that is yeah. taught by many, you know, is included in many, many um, other universities' courses is a huge impact factor as well. So eager to work with you on more sources and how to include them. That, that's great. Now, I'll refer back to the, uh, the ORCID project that Adnan uh, mentioned because, as Adnan mentioned, the sort of first uh, goal of this project is to come up, ORCID stands for the Open Researcher and Contributor ID. So they're trying to come up with an identification uh, system that can be uh, essentially federated across all the players, um, but then not just counting. This isn't just an authorship. Um, it is looking at people who are contributing to projects, who are providing data sets, who are blogging, and it's looking, it's, it's then leading leading into a secondary project, which is moving beyond impact and looking at other, other measures there. So um, I don't think the people involved in this presentation are by any means the, uh, the, the world of people who are interested in doing this. So a lot of efforts underway. And I, I'll, I'll just quickly add to Alex's point also that we actually have a lot of um, inquiries all the time about what are we thinking about in terms of data sets that's beyond just papers, right? And we've actually had cases where people have talked to us about, hey, have you thought about adding presentations, right? Have you thought about adding courseware um, into this data set? And, um, and, I th and I think, as Alex said, like, those are all really, really interesting um, 
expansions or extensions of the service. Um, we wanted to focus in on the papers just to make sure we nail that first, um, and then everything else is open for discussion. Okay, we'll do uh, just two more questions here. I th oh, no, we got a couple more, but we, we have the mic over here now. Okay, thank you very much. In academic search, how did you come up with the categories or how do you do the classification into the domains of authors, papers, journals? Because a quick search showed that there's some differences between academic search classification and ISI classification, for example. Shin, did you want to take that? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the question is that uh, about uh, how do we come up with the uh, categories and classifications, right? So um, we, we did reference the ISI um, um, system. And then uh, we are not the experts in really uh, the ontology of all those domains. So we are open for suggestions. But we know kind of a, when we start from computer science, we know that uh, we think we know that uh, it should be sub, uh, it should be divided in, in, in 23 or so subdomains, but uh, when we first published that, of course we got a lot of feedbacks because people, I mean, different people have different opinions about how to divide a certain domain into subdomains, and um, as we, as I said, we are not trying to kind of uh, create and promote our own classification. So we try to follow the uh, I think it's the kind of ESI uh, 22 domains right now, but. We also we constantly get feedback that people say, "Well, it has pros and cons." So, I mean, we are. I think this belongs to the partnership. We we, we want to work with the um, academic community to see what is the best way to um, to move forward. Yeah. And, and you probably like you can probably Actually, choose I'll any see. classification, and someone will say, um, "I don't think that's that accurate." Right? Um, you'll have some complaints somewhere. So, which comes back to our API story where. We, we have we can we want to allow everyone else to be able to say you know what like here is the classification that I think makes more sense um, and they can do their own classification not have to just depend on our classification as well. But if I'm using it in teaching, for example, I want to make sure. You know, if I'm using it in teaching, I want to make sure that uh, some fields aren't misrepresented. So I welcome the opportunity Absolutely. to work with you and yes. collaborate and Definitely. with our discipline and talk to you about it. So, and just in terms of giving us, the, uh, giving us a chance to do our own, one of the things we're trying to work on is doing this automated version using these hierarchical maps. So we let the citations themselves, and we've done this for ISA, and, and, and people have come to our website when we do it with journals, and they said, wait, this journal isn't in this field because ISI said it was in this field, because they hand curate these, and they spend a lot of resources trying to do this hand curation, and we've been sticking to these, but kind of one of our goals has been to do it automatically. And you know, there are some things that are similar, but we let the citations, we try to do it as objectively as possible, we let the citations, and they, we use this hierarchical map, and it says you're in this little subcluster just based on how it all links together. And then we try to label it with semantic information, so that's... And, and on the academic search side, there's sort of two tiers to it. The, your question was, how do we decide on the actual classification uh, system that we're using? Um, and again, we started with the computer science subdomains, which I think evolved originally from the DBLP classifications yeah. or so, something around there. Maybe some of our own tweaks. So. so we didn't set out to invent our own. We said, who's using <laughs> one that we can, we can use? There's a secondary problem, though, which is then how do we categorize the, the papers and the journals and the conferences into those systems? And that, that's also an imperfect thing. We don't have a team of catalogers who are going through on a paper by paper, paper basis and saying this one belongs in uh, you know, software engineering and this one belongs in computer networks. And so that's part of the ongoing research here, which is given a set of documents in the world, given a classification system, how well can we come up with a training model that then categorizes those papers? All right. So right here in the middle, with, and then we'll get the mic down to you. Have you, have you exported your uh, name disambiguation feature set via the API? Uh, the question is that uh, the uh, name disambiguation AP, uh, features through the API. Um, so right now from the API, you can query, a, you can input a string and then get back the, the, the uh, list of authors. Uh, is, that what, is that enough for you? Or you mean the, the internal, kind of the algorithm for the, uh, for the name design equation? So what features do you see of the, the highest ranked set of uh, options that, you, that your algorithm thinks? So I can use yours as a signal to my own uh, disambiguation yeah. effort? Can you repeat, repeat? Yeah, so the, um, uh, so the question is that can we, can we kind of output the, the highest rank name clusters 
out so that um, um, other people can can use that as a reference, right? Um, our, our researchers are trying to publish a paper, <laughs> so you can cite it. But uh, that's a good question. We 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 can do that, but um, probably might not be part of the public API because it, it kind of a uh, we want. We expect the user of the public API try to kind of use our existing data and solve their problems. But if we have, if if, if it's possible to do some deep level collaboration, where well, you can access our uh, internal data. I mean, you don't have to call through the public API, right? We can we can talk offline about that. Right, um, and you. just to add to that, the example that Shin showed um, on the website, the Michael Cohen example. So if you use the API and you s feed it Michael Cohen as the query string it will come back with the same results of the list that you saw on the website. Right? So then it's listed, and you can go through those. You can parse those and see like, which ones have a lot of, um, like have pictures, have organization information. If they have picture, organization information, they're probably verified, and they're more, um, you, you could be more confident about those than the Michael A. Cohen, which might have one paper. And we do, the API also exposes the same things that you'll get on the website. So if, if we have a merged author, that is Mike, somebody uh, publishes Mike Cohen in this paper, but w that resolves to this uh, Michael A. Cohen, then same thing through the API. If you search for Mike Cohen, you'll get back that same list of IDs uh, that, that the website is using. Right. The API doesn't give you anything that the website doesn't give you, I guess. Down here. So uh, I have a question for Anand. Um, uh, going forward for the API, um, do you see that uh, uh, things like from eScience and, and what Tony Hay has been talking about and in the integration of things uh, outside of the publication network, what, what's the plans for academic search uh, in integrating things beyond just the paper? You mentioned data sets and other things, but do you have a long-term plan for that or is it just going to be hyperlinks into uh, people's websites or people's data sets? And uh, sorry, one more question. Uh, is the, uh, do you have plans for the longevity of the API? Because uh, sometimes we've heard some people uh, or uh, other unnamed industry sources, right? Uh, they, they will put up an API, and when they get enough traction, they uh, can support it. Because I can see, if you have 27 million uh, citations now, right, or, or papers now, and 100 million later, you're going to be hit very hard mm -hmm. by lots of interested uh, researchers, including uh, most of the people in this room, I think. Absolutely, great, great, great questions. Um, so let me answer the second one first, and, I'll, and then I'll go with the first one. Um, so we don't have any plans to shut down our APIs, <laughs> right? Um, so, and I mean, and in this industry, I guess it, you could just say like, um, nothing is forever, maybe, but we actually have no plans to shut down APIs. In fact, we actually have plans to make them better, um, to support more scenarios, um, and more cool, cool applications like what you saw Jevin do. So if you're interested in doing some on top of the APIs, we encourage you 120% to go and, and do it. Um, and if there are things that you think the APIs can do better, please let us know, and, and we'll definitely take that into consideration to improve our service. And in fact, I'll say two more things on there. We're starting to build our own uh, user experiences, uh, and I, I believe the Windows Phone 7 app as well, on top of our own API. So it's not a, it's not a sort of a separate feature that we're offering out. It's, a, it's an integral part of our infrastructure. The map was on the API too. Yeah. The, uh, the academic map. It is also the case uh, that one of the reasons that we ask you to register in order to get an API key is that we would really like to grow up the community of people who are using the API and develop a relationship, understand what people are developing, understand where they'd like to see us take the API. So I, I can imagine that we will see the API grow, um, but that can't always be additive. We will probably retire things over time, but we're, we won't hopefully won't get to the stage where we've just one day put up a blog posting saying we've turned off all of our APIs. Hopefully that will be part of a dialogue. I'd like to share a story. Uh, so we released the API to some alpha users, right? And then one of the users in one of the universities, um, I imagine they, the, the professor asked the students, say, well, just let's just get the data out. So we, we certainly we see that we have a lot of heat from that, from that IP. I imagine they, they do a loop, say, for I equal to zero to uh, 23 million, uh, get all the papers, right? And then our server cannot, 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 cannot support it this way. So um, if you all pl use our API nicely, I think we can, we can sustain. Right. But if you all go through, 
do a loop, say, from one to, to one to 100 million, then get all the data down, and our, we, we just, uh, our side will go down, basically. So, yeah, it really depends on the community, how to, how to use it and then make it better. Right, right, right. And, 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 and that's another reason why we do have the app IDs, right, to monitor yeah. that. To, um, and this goes back to our partnerships. And we have to, we have to acknowledge that we are working with publishers and, and there is a certain set, set of agreements that we go into to get that data to you guys, right? And, and they wouldn't be very happy if there's a loop that says zero to 100 million, get all the papers, right? Um, so, so, so we want to balance all of those. And as Shin said, if, every, if everyone is um, kosher about it, then it should be fine. Going now to your first question so, uh, about, yeah, the, about the additional data. Uh, again, I want to really emphasize right now our focus is absolutely on the papers. Um, we really, really want to make sure we get the coverage up uh, and the domains and get all, as many domains as possible and as many papers as possible, as soon as possible. And then we are definitely interested in adding more sources. Um, what form will they take? I can't comment on that right now because we haven't really looked into it. Um, we'll look at each data set on its own merit and figure out what's the best integration point that makes sense. We, we have lots of ideas. We'd love to hear opinions from the community. Uh, data sets themselves are pretty high up on that list, and we're participating in the data site project right now. So um, yeah, F send feedback our way. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming this morning. We, we are a little bit over time right now. So uh, thank you all, and I'd like you to join me in thanking our speakers today. Thanks. <laughs>